Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Word of the Day podcast, coming to you, as always, pre-recorded from the RAV4 studios. My name is Jamie Silva, I am your host, and I think this is as good a time as any to pleasantly explain another useful word. Today's word is kind of a weird one, but in a cool way, I think. This is the noun druthers, and I would say that it means personal preferences or inclinations. Most of the time, you'll see this word in the phrase, if I had my druthers, which basically means, if I had it my way. So, if I wanted to go fishing this afternoon, I might say, if I had my druthers, I'd be gone fishing this afternoon. And you'll also occasionally hear it just used interchangeably with the word preferences, i.e. Eddie's druthers were for a walk on the beach. The online version pretty much agrees. It reads as follows, quote, a person's preference in a matter, unquote. And in my experience, the person in question is generally the speaker, the person talking about their own druthers, not someone else's. Not that only selfish people would say druthers, this is just how it's ordinarily used. Now, the etymology of druthers is pretty simple. You just take the phrase, I'd rather, and kind of smash it together and change the pronunciation a bit. And just like that, you have druthers. I mean, if you say, I'd rather, kind of fast, like, I'd rather, you're a lot of the way there already. Thus, what you're really saying here is, If I had my rathers, which is to say, if I could have or do the thing I would rather have slash do. You are switching what's called an adverbial phrase, I'd rather, to the noun, druther, but the concept is exactly the same. Now, there was a time when druther was first appearing in print that it wasn't acting as a noun as it is today. Instead, it functioned as just an alternate spelling of the word rather. For example, in the following line from Mark Twain's book, Tom Sawyer, one kid says to another, quote, Say, I'm going a-swimming, I am. Don't you wish you could? But of course, you'd rather work, wouldn't you? Of course you would, unquote. So here, the spoken phrase, you'd rather, appears in the written text as you'd druther, presumably in order to reflect how folks around that time and place actually said the word. And this is a great example of how changes in speech and pronunciation often make their way into written language as well. Like, people were already saying, I'd rather, instead of I'd rather, so authors and writers just started writing it that way to match. There are all sorts of examples of this elsewhere in the language, and here are just a few of them. Most people know the word howdy as like an old-timey, folksy kind of greeting, often seen in such phrases as, howdy, fellas, or howdy, partner. And extra points, by the way, if you say either of those while wearing cowboy boots. The full formal phrase here would be, how do you do? Which, over time, was shortened verbally to, how do you do? And then, how do you do? Which is just a bit different. And lastly, once again, the final stage, howdy. Nowadays, people don't say howdy very often. At least, not where I live. But they do say, by way of greeting, what's up? Or sometimes just, sup? And wouldn't you know it, that form of sup is now recognized, at least in some dictionaries, as its own word, with, of course, the exact same meaning. Likewise, the word goodbye is actually a condensed form of the phrase God be with ye, which was like a a parting blessing, and used to be a standard way to bid people farewell. Lastly, there is one phrase that I would like to add to this list, and it comes from a question that I basically never hear people say in its entirety. I'm talking about the question, what are you doing? and specifically the way people say it when they're just kind of curious about what someone is up to. The way I hear it, what are you doing, converts to what you doing. And sometimes it's shortened all the way to something that sounds like chadoon. This, I think, if written out, would be spelled C-H apostrophe D-O-O-N chadoon. Once again, this is not a real phrase, or at least not in written form. You won't find it in any dictionaries. But I do think it's something people actually say. So who knows? Perhaps it's a neologism in the making. Also, as an additional little etymology sidebar here, the word rather, as kind of the root of druthers, comes from an old English word that meant quickly, promptly, or immediately. And this makes me think of how people say, you know, I'd sooner do X than Y, which is kind of an odd turn of phrase if you think about it. Like, the word sooner is about time, or like the order in which things occur or are done. And this is weird, because people saying they'd sooner do X than Y are not saying they'd prefer to get X out of the way first before happily moving on to Y. No, they're saying I'd rather do X than Y. It's not about sequence, right? It's about preference. So if I said I'd sooner poke myself repeatedly with a pin than sit through another chemistry lecture, I'm not saying that as long as the poking is all finished before class begins, then it's all good. Rather, I'm expressing the idea that in this weird world where I actually have this choice, I'd rather submit to self-administered pin jabbings than attend this boring class. 
Now, I can present for you today no definitive proof for this theory, uh, that the phrase, I'd sooner do X, exists because the root of rather means soon or right away. So this is all, uh, again, just a, a fun theory at present. It seems plausible, uh, but it may just be all in my head. But back to Druthers, and in particular, a note about usage. When used to express a preference, which again, it basically always is, the connotation is nearly always that the stated preference runs counter to reality, that it can't or won't be fulfilled. And this means that there's often a hypothetical, almost a wistful tone to the phrase, if I had my druthers. As in, if things were different and the world ran how I wanted it to, I'd actually have my druthers. But it doesn't, and I don't. So I'll just have to pose these what-if scenarios, these alternate realities in which my druthers are realized. Now, since people pine for things they can't or don't have all the time, this is an extremely useful word. And if I had my druthers, I'd hear it all the time. But since I don't hear it basically at all, perhaps a couple examples of how to use druthers in ordinary conversation or writing would help. Example number one. If I had my druthers, said Nigel firmly, three-day weekends would be mandatory at least once a month and not counting holidays. Example number two. When Polly's sister brought her a cup of frozen yogurt with an assortment of toppings on it, Polly happily accepted. Truth be told, her druthers were for more cheesecake cubes on top and fewer gummy bears, but she kept this to herself. Example number three. When presented with a choice, Sheldon had an annoying habit of always expressing a preference for unmentioned or unavailable options. If told to choose between tacos or sushi, for example, he'd say, well, if I had my druthers, we'd order a pizza. If asked to opine on which movie he and his friends should go see, he'd say, you know, honestly, my druthers are more for live theater, plays, and musicals and such. As a result, Sheldon often attended live theater shows on his own. Okay, that is it for the examples, which means it is now time for another edition of the extremely popular segment, Sayings No One Says, in which we take a look at stuff people say and ask why, and also we look at stuff people don't say and ask why not. Today's saying, or phrase really, is west of the Mississippi, or as it's also sometimes put, this side of the Mississippi. But since most of the people saying it are, in fact, west of the Mississippi, geographically speaking, the meaning is practically the same. This phrase is most commonly used to describe things that are superior or superlative in some way. So, for example, you might hear a restaurant boast the best prime rib west of the Mississippi. Or perhaps a small Wyoming town could tout its 5,000 square foot cactus museum, named Fantastic Cactuses, as the largest cactus-specific museum this side of the Mississippi. Now, what I find curious about this phrase is its focus on a rather unconventional geographic area as the zone within which the size or quality or remarkableness of something must be judged. I mean, I get the best cup of coffee in LA or best pizza in Illinois thing. Like, these are known, definite regions that people refer to all the time, and so it makes sense to have a list of the best and coolest things inside each. But one wonders, what's so special about the Mississippi River where you have to split things into, like, the best stuff on this side, the western side, versus the best stuff on the other? And also, why can't the fine folks on the other side of the Mississippi have their favorites and top ten lists that are like, here are the best nature hikes east of the Mississippi, or on either side? It could be that this is like a, a National League versus American League thing, where you have two different categories of basically the same thing, in this case baseball, and then you have an MVP in each, a Cy Young in each, a pennant winner in each, etc, etc. And I realize this isn't only a baseball thing, this is the system in most sports where you have two main leagues that compete against each other in the championship, but still, it feels pretty arbitrary. However, just as there are, actually, interesting historical reasons for the existence of the National and American Baseball Leagues, the same thing may be going on with the phrase west of the Mississippi. Starting with the baseball angle first, uh, partly because I mentioned it and partly because it gives me the chance to talk about baseball. See, back in the late 19th century, when baseball was just getting started in organized form, the National League was kind of the only game in town. But in 1901, the American League was founded, as like a, a more genteel and player-friendly alternative. The American League had higher salaries, uh, players could veto trades of themselves to other teams, and, would you believe it, players were reimbursed for any medical costs incurred as a result of on-field injuries. Such generosity. With these advantages, the American League hired away a bunch of players from the National League, and the rivalry was born. 
National League owners actually refused to play the champs of the American League at first, viewing them as player poaching upstarts. But with the AL fielding good teams, drawing more fans, and expanding into new cities, the NL had no choice but to engage. And so, in 1903, the first interleague championship, known initially and more accurately not as the World Series but as the Championship of the United States, was born. Thus, at least at the beginning, there was a legitimate reason to recognize the best such-and-suches of both leagues. They were actually different organizations. Now, back to the phrase, West of the Mississippi. If we had to hazard a guess about how this phrase got going and why it makes sense, it would go like this. America was settled, by Europeans at least, gradually, from east to west. And so, of course, the fanciest and the best of everything would generally be found towards the east coast, whereas the rural, undeveloped, uh, stereotypically dangerous west boasted few luxuries or landmarks that could compare to those of the urbanized east. So, cutting as it did through or along the borders of Louisiana, Mississippi, Tennessee, Missouri, Illinois, and a few other states, the Mississippi River could logically form a geographic and, more importantly, a mental division between frontier life in the West and civilized, economically developed life in the East. In this context, it makes sense that if you started up a little restaurant in the untamed western wilderness, and you advertised the best cup of hot coffee and hard-boiled eggs in these here United States, you'd probably be laughed right off the Great Plains. But although you couldn't lay claim to the national title, you know, the prestige of being the best on both sides of the Mississippi, you could perhaps focus on being the biggest, baddest, best, and or coolest on this side, that is, west of the Mississippi. This is kind of like carving out your own smaller region of competition in order to make your business look better. Like, we here at the Word of the Day podcast can't claim that this is the best podcast in America, or the best podcast west of the Mississippi, nor really even in the greater Bay Area in California, which is where we record. Neither could we confidently assert that we're the best language podcast around. Though, I mean, if, if you think that, who are we to disagree? While this may seem discouraging, what if we were, say, the best language podcast on the San Francisco Peninsula that is also recorded in a RAV4? There, I think it's fair to say, we might actually have a shot, a real claim to supremacy, if you will. Anyway, the upshot of all this, for those of you listeners on the western side of the Mississippi, is that if you think you can get away with it, don't limit yourself and your claims of greatness to this side. Also, I know we have some listeners abroad in several countries around the globe, and I'm sure many of you out there live near a river as well, on one side or the other. So, your job, uh, you overseas listeners, is to repurpose this phrase, adapt it to your homeland, and perhaps promise, you know, the, the best falafel this side of the Nile, the most soothing cup of tea south of the Thames, the best wontons this side of the Yangtze, or the best ecotourism expeditions north of the Amazon. The possibilities are as limitless as the number of major rivers in the world, by which I mean there are exactly 179 possibilities as defined by Wikipedia's list of the world's major rivers, which is in turn defined as any major river system over a thousand kilometers in length. And once again, there are 179 of those at last count, so I guess check your surroundings to see if one is nearby. Uh, you never know what you might find. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I think that'll do it for us. That'll do it for today's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I know if I had my druthers, you'd recommend this show to your friends, and then you could all start using these words, and pretty soon you'd probably be known as the most articulate bunch of folks west of Insert River here. All right, this has been another edition of the Word of the Day podcast. My name is Jamie Silva saying so long from the Rav4 Studios. We hope you enjoyed the program, and we'll see you next time.